Likutei Sichos, Chelik Yud, Volume 10, Second Sicha for Parshas Chaye Soda. I would make a suggestion before we begin the Sicha that you take a few moments to review the Psukim which are applicable to this Sicha in order to better understand and have the better ability to follow the back and forth of the Sicha. Although, I must say that if you don't do that, the Sicha will be pretty fine and clear on its own. That's only if you have the time. Uh, I would suggest that you look from Perik Chof Dalit, that's chapter 24, from Pasik Nun, that's Pasik uh, 50th verse, through Pasik Nun Ches, through verse 58, and get a better picture and clarity, the narrative of the back and forth of what uh, took place. Another interesting thing is this Sicha is several Rashis bunched together, and you really see the Sicha, you'll see how it's the same Rashi that is giving us the insights into the Pshute Shal Mikra. And one Rashi, so to speak, compares notes to the other. In other words, the rationale in one Rashi is, in this case, based on a rationale based on other Rashis and other Psukim, either before or after. But moreover, it has to follow the same storyline. It has to follow the same rationale and make sense. And the third thing, at the end of the Sicha, we'll learn to have some fascinating insight into, you know, maturity age, including bar mitzvah and so on, and some applicable halachas that come out from it. Let's begin. In our parsha, where it discusses the negotiations back and forth between Eliezer and the family of Rivka about her marriage to Yitzchak, Rashi has some very interesting things and which require some insight and we need to really focus on and understand how they all come together. Let's start with the Pasik, Pasik, um, uh, chapter 24, Pasik 57. It says over there, they said, let's call the young girl Vinishala Espio and we will ask her, we'll ask her and let her say what she wants. And Rashi comments, from here we see that you do not marry off a woman only with her agreement, only Elamidaita, only by her consent. So the Rebbe asks, one second. Previously, in Pasik Nun and Nun Aleph, that's 50 and 51, what happened there? It says over there, Love and Abisul said, Here's Rivka, take her, go, and let her be a wife for your master's son. So you see that they already agreed to the shidduch. They didn't bother asking her if she consents or not. Correct? And another thing that comes up, another thing that comes up, when it says in the Pasuk, in, in verse 55, in Nun Hei, it says, Vayoymer ochiya v'ima. Her brother and her sister responded. And Rashi goes, where's Bsuel? Where's the father? And Rashi says, Bsuel, he tried to hold back. He tried to prevent this marriage to happen. And therefore, Amalach came and killed him. This is Pshutei Shal Mikra. In other words, what do you see? That if anybody was trying to hold it back, it was Bsuel. He was eliminated. He's already not in the picture. But her brother and her mother... Lovan and his mother, they're in full consent with it. And what suddenly changed? Over here, it seems clear that they oppose the Shidduch and they say, no, we don't want this to happen. And in fact, we're going to ask her if she wants to go. And moreover, from Rivka's response and the way Rashi explains her response, her response is, quote, I will go even if you we don't want me to go. Even if you don't consent, I'm going to leave on my own. So, so far we need a clarity as to what's going on here. Do you have to ask the woman? They consented. Suddenly they retracted their consent. Or so it seems. What happened over here? <clears throat> Another question. If in fact this is the case, that you do not marry off a woman unless she consents to it, how did they consent to this whole marriage in the first place? 
And moreover, it seems that at the time of the initial consent, what is it that they said? Take her, take her and go right away. The Rebbe continues with another Rashi. The Rashi on the words where they requested, they said, Teshev Hanara Itonu Yomimai Osar. They said, let the young girl stay with us for either 12 months or if not, 10 months. And what does Rashi say? Rashi comments, why did they request for 12 months? What was What's behind this? That this was the normal mode this is the normal uh, custom that you give a young girl that's getting married, you give her 12 months to prepare for the marriage. And Rashi says, the finest is atzma betachshitim. In order to get, to get all her needs, all the jewelry and all the nice dresses and everything that she needs in order to be ready for the marriage. So again, the Rebbe asks a few, several questions, three questions. First of all, it's obvious it's clear, everybody understands, you don't need Rashi to tell you, that a young woman who's getting married needs time to prepare for the marriage, needs time to get herself ready. So what is Rashi adding by telling us, you know, that it's because you need 12 months in order to prepare, and this is the normal custom. In other words, had Rashi not said anything, we would have understood that that was their estimation, that that's what they need, and therefore... They asked for it. But if Rashi felt it necessary to explain why they asked for 12 months, then why doesn't he also explain why they asked for 10 months? Why they were ready to concede and go down to 10 months? And if perhaps we can argue the other way around, perhaps maybe it's just that they felt that Rivka in particular, notice that word, Rivka in particular, in her special situation, she needs 12 months. But from where does Rashi derive that this is the norm? This was the normal custom that a girl, a young woman who's getting married needs 12 months. And then, of course, the third question, if indeed this is the case, this is the established uh, custom, that a woman gets 12 months when she's preparing for marriage, if so, why would they concede to 10, to 10 months? Why would they suddenly go down from 12 to 10 months? Where is the rationale in this? In other words, how does this all stick? So the Rebbe says, in order, we'll now put everything together. This whole puzzle comes together and will all make sense. And here is the explanation. On the Pasuk, which we began with, which said, Vinishala Espia, let us ask her, let's talk to her and ask her if she consents to this. Rashi was forced to explain that they were actually contesting the whole idea of this Shidduch. In other words, it's not just that they were contesting the fact that he wants to take her now versus leaving her home for 12 months and then come to pick her up later. But they were now contesting the whole shidduch. Because the words they said, you look in the verses, what did they say? They called her over and they said, quote, im Are you ready to go with this man? They didn't say, are you ready to go now with this man? They asked her, are you ready to go with this man? However, the question we asked before, did they not already consent to this? In other words, what suddenly changed? Says the Rebbe, this is the key here. This, the fact that they consented before, and now they seem to be going back to reneging on that consent, tells us that something happened in between then and now that made them have a change of heart, that made them change their mind. What is that? Let's look at the answer that initially Besuel, while he was still alive, Besuel and Lovon gave to the man, to Eliezer. What is the words they used? They said, quote, May Hashem Yotza Hadover. This is from Hashem. We see that Hashem orchestrated the whole thing. And we cannot tell you yes or no. We, know that we cannot contest this. We cannot argue with this. Take Rivka and go like Hashem said. Notice these words, like Hashem said. Now, they didn't hear Hashem. 
What does Rashi explain? How does Rashi explain these words? Rashi says to him, look, we cannot do anything. We cannot say anything to refuse because it seems from your words. In other words, they were taking him by his word. And all the miracles you describe to us, that indeed Hashem wants this to happen. So we're not anyone to stand in the way of Hashem's will, of what Hashem wants. So they agreed to the Shidduch because they relied on Eliezer and his whole story, the whole narrative that he gave them. And because of that, they accepted that this is Hashem's will. However, when it came to the response of Eliezer on their request that she stay with them either 12 months or 10 months and after that she should go. And that's when he said, no, 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 no. Don't hold me back. Eliezer says, please, Al Ta'achiro says, don't delay me. I got to go. I got to go right away. Take her and go. That's when they responded with, wait one second. You know what? We have to think this over. Let's call Rivka and see if we consent to this in the first place, if she consents to this. See, their taina, their argument was that even though as far as their consent is concerned, they've already finalized the shidduch, um, but still, because this comes from Hashem, but since in the time of when they finalized the shidduch, several minutes before, or whatever time it took, until this point. Eliezer never spoke about leaving immediately. Eliezer never spoke about picking up the way, you know, just in that moment, taking Rivka and going. They were under the impression that this is a normal shidduch. And in a normal shidduch, what is the normal custom? That you give a kala, you give a bride 12 months, or they requested, we'll soon see why, at least 10 months, in order to prepare herself. But when Eliezer refused... That got them thinking. That put some idea in their head. Who is this guy? Do we really take him for his word? This is irrational. Something is wrong here. Something doesn't make sense here. In other words, maybe we jumped too quickly to consent to this shidduch. Remember, the words they said before was, we're consenting based on your words, on what you're telling us, on the nice, beautiful story that you're giving us. And therefore, now... When Eliezer raises a certain level of suspicion in their minds that something is not kosher here, something is not right, that's when they got thinking about the whole shidduch and they said, you know what? Till now we thought this is an unconventional thing to the extent that what? That Hashem wants it to happen. He made all these miracles. Everything coincided in such a way that you landed in our home without even knowing who we are. And you came to the right place. And met all the criteria that you had and Avram Avinu had. So we figured, okay, this is the right thing. But now that you're behaving in such a manner, now we need to go back to what normally should take place. What is the norm? You call the Kala, the potential Kala. You call the girl. You call the woman. And you ask her if she wants to get married. You don't just force her into something. And this is, we can understand... Why Rashi emphasizes, why Rashi feels the need to explain that when they ask for 12, 12 months or 10 months, Rashi immediately tells us because this is the norm. This is the key over here. Because it's the norm and because this is what always happens, this raised their suspicion. This made them, you know, think twice about the whole thing and become very suspect of the whole, the whole consent that they gave and therefore they were now wanted to retract it. But the question is, if that's the case, as we asked in the beginning, if that's the case that this is the norm to have 12 months of preparation for a kala, then how come they they themselves asked for 12 and immediately said, well, you know what, if not 12, at least 10. Make up your mind. Is the custom 12 or is there no custom? If there's no custom, then the whole explanation the Rebbe gave seems to fall apart. The explanation is based on the fact that they realize something is up here. Something is wrong. Something is not the ordinary. The answer is that they reasoned and they said, look, you want to go. Okay, the norm is 12. Perhaps in this particular situation, in this case, we could cut away two months. Why? 
Because remember the Psukim already told us that Eliezer already produced some jewelry. As soon as they consented, he opened his bag and he gave some beautiful jewelry for her, whatever it was. So they said, look, we're already ahead of the game. So if you're not going to consent to 12, which is the norm, which is the minhag, the custom, and which happens for everyone, but everybody starts from zero. We're already starting, we're ahead of the game because you already brought some of this stuff. Okay, but at least 10 months. In other words, our estimation is that she's two months ahead of the game, but at least 10 months. But not to just pick up and go. When Eliezer insisted, no, Shalchuni, send me right now. This is when they said, whoa, let's go and ask Rivka, hear it from her. Is she really interested in going or not? And the Rebbe says, and we're already in chapter 8, that there's actually a wonderful deal. You can even see the emphasis, a point that Rashi, the way Rashi presents it, that you can see beautifully how Rashi really is, 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 is clarifying to us and, and something amazingly um, insightful in this Rashi that we can learn. This is already in addition to the Pshutei Shomikra that we have already experienced. And what is that? You know that the Rashis have a source. Even when Rashi brings an explanation or a medrash, it has a source, a Gemara somewhere. So the source for this Rashi, where Rashi says, quote, we do, you do not marry off a, a, uh, a woman against her will. You have to get her consent. Actually, in the Mishnah, I'm sorry, in the Medrash, the Lashon is, Ein Masim Es Hayisoyma El Alpio. Over there, the true Lashon is that you do not marry off an orphan girl only with her consent. But Rashi chose to change that. And Rashi says, Ein Masim Es Haisha. You don't marry off a woman, which usually is a reference to somebody who's an adult woman. And somebody who's not an adult is called a Naira or a Ktana. But in this case, Rashi refers to her as a woman. You don't marry off a woman without her consent. Why this change? Why did Rashi change it? The answer is, where Rashi is trying to hint to us, and this is a beautiful deal in Rashi, that even though Rivka was indeed age-wise, she was a small child, we know that she was three years old, yet Rashi is referring to her, Rashi is emphasizing that she was like an Isha. She had the maturity of a woman. And therefore, she had the, since she has that maturity, therefore, they said, let's go and ask her. She's not a, a young child. She's not a little kid. We can't make decisions for her. Remember, once they realized that perhaps their decision was wrong. And this, we'll go visit now a later Parsha. In Parsha's Toyodos, in reference to Yaakov and Esau, the two twins, it says, quote, that the, 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 the young boys, they grew older. And what happened? Esau went out to the fields and Yaakov was at Ishtam. He sat and he studied. So Rashi comments, why does the Torah have to tell us this? That the Torah is telling us that as long as they were still under the age of 13, as long as they were young, nobody really recognized their true character. In fact, Rashi also adds the words, no one paid attention. No one tried to investigate, to check and find out their true character. It's only when they became older when they became 13, did everybody realize clearly that this guy is going down this path and Yaakov is going down the other path? In general, when you look at an adult, you can tell from the way they behave, from their actions, you, from their demeanor, you can tell what their true character is. A child, however, when they're small, when they're young, you can't. You can't. Right? You don't know where the child's going to go. People mature. People reach a certain age and they start to behave more maturely. And that's when you can make a, a call, so to speak, on what their character is, what type of person they are. In accordance with this, 
we can understand why Rashi goes into a lengthy description of explaining the words, and they became older. Why couldn't Rashi just say they became 13? Why does he go into the whole thing that they, they while they were young, you couldn't tell them, you know, you couldn't tell the true character and it, nobody paid attention to it. It's only later. The answer is that what Rashi is telling us that the age 13 is not what makes a person mature. It's just that on average, listen to this closely, on average, typically, most people, by age 13, that's when they become mature. And that's when you can tell in what direction they're heading. That's when you can tell the character. However, if one would have paid closer attention to, let's say, Yaakov and Esau, and this case, this is the case by, by, by all youth, by all children, Perhaps even at an earlier age, you can already tell, there's already the signs of what this person is. And perhaps some people can mature even much earlier than 13. The reason for the age of 13 is because this is the average age that the Torah tells us that at this age, you can already tell everybody has already reached more or less their maturity. But there are many who can reach it earlier. In Rivka's case, it's clear and obvious that she reached the maturity at a much earlier age. And it was obvious. It was something that was evident. We see, we know the whole story. Eliezer asked for some signs and he certainly saw her character and, and clearly her, her level of maturity in the way she responded to him and his request for water and so on. And that's why the words that Rashi uses, Venisha, Ein Masiyim Esa Isha El Alpia. Rashi refers to her as a Isha. You don't marry off a woman. She already had a maturity. She had a mental capacity and the emotional capacity of an adult woman. And therefore, Rashi refers to her as such. Another very interesting thing, says the Rebbe, you see from the wondrous things, the Rebbe said, in Yonim Miflayim, that in Rashi, that we know that in Halacha, the Halacha that says that, let's say, for example, a boy, or in the case of a girl, is 12, a boy turns bar mitzvah at age 13, there's actually a debate in halacha as to what the reason for it is, and what's the source of it. There, there's one opinion, there's two major opinions. One opinion says that we actually learn it out from a Pasuk. The Pasuk of Shimon and Levi, the two brothers, the two sons of Yaakov, when they went to destroy Shechem, what happens? The Torah refers to them. It says, ish harbay. The Torah refers to them as a man. And if we make the calculations when they were born, and they both shared the same age for a while, they had two, you know, the same birthday within the same year, the same calendar year, they were both 13. And the Torah refers to them as ish. So that's the source that one has turned, a boy at least, turns mature, is, 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 is bar mitzvah at the age of 13. It becomes a man. However, the other prevailing opinion is that it has nothing to do with the psukim. Rather, it is a halacha l'moishim Sinai. Meaning, this is a halacha, this is a fact, a tradition that's been passed down from Moshe Rabbeinu on, you know, he received it from Hashem directly at Har Sinai. There's no actual verse for it. What's the difference? What's the difference if you say it's from this source or a, a source that uh, you source it in a Pasuk, or it's a Lach Lamesh in Sinai? The answer is that a Goy, a Ben Noyach, is Mechuyev, is obligated to keep the Sheva Mitzvah Ben Noyach. The question is, at what age does a Ben Noyach become obligated, and therefore can be punishable, to keep um, his or her Sheva Mitzvah Ben Noyach? In other words, at what age are they considered an adult in order to, to become obligated to keep the Sheva Mitzvah in Nayach? If you say that the source of it is a Pasuk, meaning the Pasuk that I quoted before, then that applies to Sheva Mitzvah in Nayach. It applies to everyone. Because the Torah is telling us, look, at the age of 13, one becomes an adult. And that's why we call Shimon Levi Ish. However, if you say that it's Allah Chalamayshah Misinai, that means that it's a specific Shi'ur. This is already a Halacha. 
And if it's a halacha that's been passed down, if it's a tradition that's been passed down from Moshe Rabbeinu, it applies only to Jews, exclusively to Bnei Yisrael. Because all these shiurim, all the different measurements, all the different criteria which apply to a yid, which are, which are in, in, in our system of halacha, does not apply to a guy. And therefore, what would be the case by a guy? Well, it's a case-to-case basis. You have to judge, is the person already on a maturity level of an adult to be able to be, to be chayiv, to be obligated in keeping the Sheva Mitzvah, Sheva, Sheva Mitzvah Benenoyach, and therefore culpable if they don't keep them. And from here you see that Rashi clearly, for at least according to Pshut Mikra, at least according to the way we explained, the way we understood the Rashi, and why Rashi refers to Rivka as a Isha, takes that this it takes upon that this is actually a halacha lemoishe misinai, and therefore you could very well refer to Rivka, which remember prior to Matan Torah, even us, the family of Ra, of Avram and Sara, or all the Aves and the Imois and all the Shvatim, we all had the status of Bnei Noach, and therefore it's on a case to case basis.